Today, we're gonna to be going step-by-step -step through my experience doing my own electrical install for this backyard workshop. That includes a new sub panel, roughing in five separate circuits, digging and burying conduit, and pulling my own permits. If you're new to this series, my name is Gianni, and this project is about building a dedicated workspace in my backyard. That includes a room to support a small art business, as well as a comfortable office space for working from home. I've been dreaming about doing something like this for a long time, and I hope you'll stick around as we take this from a 3D model to the real thing. Before I started planning out the electrical for this project, I needed to give some more thought to my interior layout. Up to this point, I had some general ideas on how I'd use the space, but it was time to make this a little bit more concrete. We'll start with the laser cutter since the initial motivation for this project was to create a workspace that I could run my small business from. I currently have a 50 watt machine that I designed and built back in 2018, and I use that to produce custom maps. The plan in the shop is to build a larger and more powerful successor to that machine that will be located here in the back right corner. On the opposite side of the space, we'll have the office set up with desks for my wife and I, along with our computers. The middle will be our assembly slash project space, so we'll have a large work table, wall storage, and cabinets. We also wanted to have an exercise corner with a bike and a TV that maybe we can use while we're waiting on the laser cutter to finish a map. Once I had this plan, I could kind of work backwards and make sure I had outlets placed conveniently for the electronics I'd have. Near the laser cutter, I'm gonna have two outlets that are each on their own 20 amp circuit. I'm thinking one will power the laser cutter itself, and the second might be useful for secondary equipment like the ventilation system and air compressor. For the TV, I'll have an outlet up on the wall near the mounting bracket so I can keep wires hidden. The rest of the interior outlets are somewhat evenly spaced around the room. From any spot along the wall, you'll never be more than three feet from an outlet. For lighting, I'll have four can lights up on the ceiling, and on the exterior, I'll have four lights as shown. We'll also place a GFCI outlet out here on the front of the shop. Lastly, we have our mini split, which will have its own dedicated 20 amp circuit. Everything discussed so far will terminate in a sub panel located inside of the workshop. This box is fed from the main panel on the back of my house, and I'll route my buried conduit out and around this walkway in order to bring the lines in on the far wall of the shop. This sub panel will be right inside from where the conduit enters the wall, and it will be located right below that eventual TV. But enough of the design, let's jump into the work and I'll cover more details as we go. I'm not a licensed electrician, but fortunately my county allows homeowners the ability to perform their own electrical work, provided they take responsibility for permitting and inspections. I passed both my rough and final inspections related to all the work I'm going to be showing in this video, but it's still important to do your own research and only use this experience as a reference. Here I'm starting with the double gang box that will contain our switches for the interior and exterior lights. I'm placing this four feet off the ground and just inside the doorway so you can easily flip the lights on right when you enter the space. Next we have the single gang outlet boxes which I'm installing about a half inch proud from the studs. This will make the box flush with the finished drywall surface. I'm also spacing these 12 inches up from the floor. With the boxes in place, I'm now drilling my pass-throughs for the wiring. I'm using a 3 quarter inch bit for these, and I'm putting them 2 feet up from the floor. I center these holes in the studs, so I leave at least an inch and a quarter from the edge of the stud to the front of that hole. These brackets are going to support the can lights and our finished ceiling. And with those in place, I'm ready to start pulling the 14 gauge wire that will make up the lighting circuit. This 15 amp circuit is going to begin in our sub panel is going to run from there over to our switch box. Here it will split into the two different paths, each controlled by one of our two switches. The first will power our exterior lights and runs up from the box to the two lights on either side of our entrance. 
After this, it travels over to the two lights located on either side of this window. The second path from our switch box controls the interior can lights and follows this route. To be safe, I'm giving myself about 12 inches of extra wire at each junction point. For each exterior light, I'm drilling a 3 and 5 eighths of an inch diameter hole in the zip sheathing. I'm then cutting the same size hole in 4 pieces of hardy trim. These boards will be a mounting plate for our finished lights. I wore the teeth off of my hole saw trying to cut through this hardy board, so I switched to the tried and true method of just drilling a ton of holes and hammering out the middle. It was definitely more work, but saved me a trip to the store. I'm adding some exterior caulk around this hole, and then I'm dropping in an old work light box. This box comes with a clamp on the back, and I'm gonna put that inside of the shop to temporarily clamp this entire assembly against our sheathing hole. Then I'm adding four screws to hold the plate permanently in place. Now we're just gonna seal around that plate's edge with some Zip System liquid flash. This mounting plate for the light is gonna make it much easier to install our lap siding later on. It gives us a nice straight edge that's simple to notch around. With our lighting circuit roughed in, we'll switch to the outlets. I'm using a 12 gauge Rumex and starting at the last box for this circuit. I'm chiseling out a knockout on the back of each box, cutting my wire to leave about 12 inches of extra length and then inserting it through. I'm then jumping to the next box in the circuit, feeding wire back from that point to the original box. I'm leaving myself a little bit of slack on the back side of the box in case I ever need it and then I'm securing the wire with a staple that's no more than six inches from the box. Lastly, I'm removing the sheathing and making sure I leave at least six inches of each wire rolled up in the box. I then repeat this until I work my way all the way back to the panel. This circuit is gonna contain the majority of our interior outlets. We then have those two dedicated circuits for the laser cutter that we went over earlier. And then the last outlet circuit catches our exterior box as well as the last interior outlet that's on that front wall. This process is called roughing in the electric and this is all we need to complete for the interior fixtures at this stage. This work is left exposed until I pass my first electrical inspection, after which we're gonna be able to add insulation, drywall, and the final outlets. The next hurdle was digging the trench for our electrical conduit. You can rent a machine for this, but I decided to just spend a day doing it all by hand. Using PVC conduit, I'm required to bury the lines 18 inches deep, and to be on the safe side, I'm gonna be going 20 inches down. If the conduit doesn't lay perfectly in the bottom of the trench, I wanted to ensure I had a little wiggle room so I would still pass inspection. Back at the sub-panel, I'm drilling through the sheathing where our electrical supply is going to be coming into the shop. I'm also drilling a hole in this hardy board that I'm going to be using to mount our conduit. This is very similar to what we did earlier with the mounting plates for the lighting. I don't have to do this for the exterior outlet since the rectangular housing is already easy to notch around. I'm following the same process for this one as the other outlets, leaving about six inches of unsheathed wire for the final install.
Lastly, I'm sealing around these penetrations using some more liquid flash. Here I'm adding another hole for our eventual fiber internet line to enter the shed. This will come through the wall about two feet to the right from our electrical supply. And now it's time to add our conduit to the trench. I'm gonna be using inch and a half PVC pipe for the power. I'm dry fitting the sections in place first and then applying PVC cement to each joint. For a conduit run like this, you don't want the total degrees of the bends in your pipe to exceed 360. And this is code because it's going to be incredibly hard for you to eventually pull cable through conduit with that many turns. I'm not very flexible with my path since I need to jog out and around this concrete, but fortunately I'm able to connect with my home panel using 315 degrees worth of bends. For the data line, I'm going to be using a 1 inch PVC pipe right alongside our power conduit. I'm going to be leaving this one empty for now and eventually pulling fiber once I'm a little closer to finishing out the interior of the workshop. I'm using fiber to isolate the line from any electrical interference. Both conduit runs are going to be right on top of each other and running parallel for almost 50 feet. You would never want to run ethernet or any other type of low voltage data line in this sort of a setup unless you're gonna be adding some shielding or creating more distance between the two pipes. Here I'm adjusting the position slightly for this PVC pipe. I'm using a heat gun to help make the PVC more pliable, and then I'm holding it in the final position I want while it cools. With the conduit in place, we're ready to start pulling our cable. My first step was placing a long ribbon at one end of the pipe and pulling it through using a shop vac from the other end. I'm then tying a stronger wire fishing cable to this and using the ribbon to pull that fish all the way back to the house panel where we originally started. Nice. With the wire fish ready, I'm using electrical tape to secure the four conductors I'm gonna be using to supply power to the shop. For this project, I'm using two gauge THHN aluminum cable, which is rated for wet locations and is a great option for using an underground conduit. These conductors are sized to provide 90 amps safely over our distance of about 60 feet. You'll notice the four wires aren't bundled in a single cladding like we saw with the Romex cable that we used for the outlets. The conduit is our cladding in this case, and we want the conductors loose from one another as it makes it much easier to pull this bundle through the pipe. The red and black wires are going to be our hots, and the white is going to be our neutral, and lastly the green will be our ground. After pulling these conductors all the way out to the workshop, I next have to install an 8-foot grounding rod. My local code requires this for a subpanel located in a separate structure. I'm just using a mallet to slowly pound this all the way into the ground. Once it's in place, this rod gets connected to a copper wire, which runs inside and terminates on the grounding bar located inside of our subpanel. Now I'm finally ready to start wiring up this panel. For the first circuit, I'm starting with one of my dedicated outlets for the laser cutter. I'm stripping the sheathing back to expose the barrack conductors for the wire located inside of the panel. I'm starting with the copper ground and mounting it to the ground bar here on the right side of the panel. Next I'm taking the white neutral wire, placing it on the neutral bus bar here on the left. You'll also notice that I'm folding the wire and leaving some slack inside of my panel in case I ever need it. I'm installing the first GFCI 20 amp breaker into the box and connecting its white pigtail wire into the neutral bus bar as well. 
And lastly, I'm taking the black wire from our circuit, connecting it to the back of this new breaker. Now I'm just repeating those steps for the other four circuits that are going to be in this panel. Later, I'm going to be installing another GFCI 20 amp breaker to supply our mini split system. I'll cover this more in the next video since that's dedicated to finishing out the interior of the workshop. All of the outlet circuits in this panel are going to be GFCI protected. The 15 amp breaker on the top right feeds our lights, but you'll notice there's another non-GFCI breaker in the bottom right as well. This breaker supplies the exterior outlet along with that one outlet on the interior. We're able to get away with a standard breaker here because the first component in that circuit is a GFCI outlet. Because of this, all downstream outlets on that same circuit are considered GFCI protected. With our circuit wiring finished, it's time to land the feed wires. I'm adding an anti-oxidation product to the bare aluminum before installing it. I'm starting with the neutral white conductor, which mounts into our neutral bus bar. Next, I'm installing the hot black and red wires, which go on the central mounts. Each wire will supply 120 volts, and it doesn't matter which color goes on which side. And lastly, we have the green ground conductor, which has already been terminated to the ground bar. In a subpanel like this, it's very important that the grounding bar and the neutral bus bar be kept totally separate. Back at the main house panel, these two are going to be bonded together, but again, this cannot be done at a subpanel. If these two components are not kept separate here, it's possible for unintended current to flow through the ground line, which could energize the subpanel enclosure. Now I'm back at the main house panel where I've cut power and I'm preparing to install the 90 amp breaker. Here I'm installing the ground wire to the bus bar. It's a pretty tight fit working around all of these existing circuits in this old panel. The neutral wire has already been terminated in the same bus bar that we're currently adding our ground to. This is a two pole breaker for our 90 amp circuit. I'm installing our two hot wires into the back of it before I snap it into place. And now we're ready to button up the sub panel before testing the power. Another thing to note, I don't have a main disconnect present at the sub panel in the shop. This is because I'm only going to have six branch circuits in the box, which is the maximum allowed before I would then be required to add a disconnect. The inspector arrived for my rough electrical inspection, and I was excited to pass on my first attempt. He stuck around while I energized the 90 amp main breaker and confirmed everything looks safe in the sub panel. With the outlets in place, it was way easier to finish the exterior. I covered all the work related to the structure in a separate video, which I'll make sure to link. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for the third and final episode of the series covering all of the interior work for this build.